Man, sales is tough. I'm just not cut out to be a salesperson. Have you ever felt that way? Selling doesn't need to be so difficult. My name is Harry Spate. I'm here to serve and to help you succeed. Join me as we discuss sales made easy. Night and you're just, you know, a wreck and you're treating your family terribly and life other than you, you maybe even have become a workaholic because you don't want to deal with the other stuff. Right. Right. So really what kind of life is that? Is that really hitting the lifestyle you want? And so business, and, and I'm sure you talk about this, just with the whole selling with dignity um, premise is that you're being true to yourself, but also serving your clients, right? And so... What is the good word? So today, everyone, we have another special guest. This one is a motivational speaker of rare power and an inspiring mentor to women. Jennifer Anderson Smith is also the author of a compelling memoir entitled So That for Relationships. She and I are going to talk a little bit about that, about business, and I really look forward to the conversation. So let's get started. Jennifer, welcome to the podcast. What's a good word today? Good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited about this. Um, you know, you, we've talked a couple of times and we connect on a couple different levels. So yeah, this is great. I'm excited. Yeah. So Jennifer, uh, for those of you who don't know her, is just like a, uh, a, not a barrel of monkeys, but a barrel of energy. And so, uh, and she laughs too. She laughs at my jokes. So uh, it's even better. <laughs> But yes, she's got tremendous energy. And when I met her, I said, you know what? This lady is going to be a great guest. And your book is actually, you know, it's not something that people look at and say that's got a, you know, a very energetic theme to it, right? It goes into trauma and challenges, right? So can we talk a little bit about that and what got you started to write it and give us a little idea of your background and... Certainly. All that stuff, because I think that will help us put it all into uh, the right place for the podcast. Sure, of course. So the book is called So That for Relationships, and it's based on the So That principle, which is uh, found in the Bible. And it's where God tells us that he provides comfort and mercy for us in our time of need so that we can share that with others in their time of need. Hmm. And so the whole purpose of writing my book was to share my experiences with other women and men too, so they can kind of get inside the head of the women who have gone through some of these things. Um, but to, to share my experiences so that other women can see, first of all, they're not alone uh, because we all think we are going through something that's unique to us and no one has ever gone through this. And that's just not true. Nothing is new under the sun. You know, this, mm. this world has been around for a few thousand years and there's nothing new under the sun. So um, and then also so that they can then understand maybe better how to go through it and how to process it and how to heal from whatever it was they went through. And then how they can even use that and create a silver lining in that cloud that then would allow them to share that same information with someone else, you know, who they encounter in their life. Because you and I are both Christian and we, I know that God only calls those he wants to have come forward and work for him. But he doesn't always give you the equipment beforehand. Sometimes he gives it as you need it. And for me personally, I experienced that. Um, for years, I've wanted to write a book. I just thought, this is what my calling is. This is what I need to do. I need to write a book. And that comes from, I love Laura Ingalls Wilder. She's a children's author that um, wrote about her family life post-Civil War. And um, just the adventures that her family went on moving from Wisconsin to Minnesota, to North Dakota, to Missouri, to all these different places and you know, helping to expand the Wild West uh, and to settle it. And I always thought how extraordinary that she wrote like eight books about her childhood and it was just an ordinary childhood. 
It was just a regular, you know, for her, she's like, why would somebody want to read this? It's just ordinary. But we can take a lot from that book in that knowing that, yeah, it might seem like your life is ordinary to you, but to someone else, there could be something in your life that helps them figure out their life. And so I knew that I needed to write a book and this is the first one that I did. And the re one reason I picked this one is it's my story, right? Mm -hmm. It's my childhood, it's my first marriage. I can't screw it up. I know the story. I live the story. So that was one reason I started with this. I have lots of other projects in the works, but um, that's one reason I started with this. Um, but I think it's important for us to share. And especially as women, uh, this society tends to pull women apart as opposed to pushing them together. And we are definitely stronger as women when we come together and work together in a group um and support each other um that you know in biblical times that is what they did the women came mm -hmm. together you don't see it in the bible but uh in the rare glimpses into the women's world that we do get that is what you see is women coming together and and building each other up not tearing each other down not competing but collaborating and i think that's really important to share yeah that's great so what do you hope that people get out of the book that you wrote the amazing incredible the number book. one thing that i hope they get out of it is that they are not alone mm -hmm. just just that you're not alone because this world is so lonely even in this time of incredible communication opportunities and availabilities and all of that um i think it's probably even lonelier than ever yeah. and and for people who are in adverse experiences which is a super polite way to say what we have gone through mm -hmm. um those people feel more alone than anyone else and part of that is because they have been conditioned to be cut off from the rest of the world in meaningful connections mm -hmm. and so uh for women to pick up this book and to understand very quickly that you know jen went through this I'm going through this. That means some one other person that I know for an absolute fact has gone through it. And then as you read through the book, you realize that each chapter, I tell a story about something that happened, right? And then the next chapter after that is how I took that experience and turned it into helping someone else or learning a way to heal from it for myself. And so the, when you read the first chapter, you're like, okay, Jen went through this. So I know I'm not alone. I got one other person that did it. And then the next chapter you read, you go, oh, Jen knew this person who dealt with the same thing. So there's another person. So now I'm going through it and Jen and another person. We got a group, mm -hmm. you know? And so just knowing that can be, um, <clears throat> excuse me, can be very powerful for women, just knowing that. Um, and then finding ways to reach out. You can reach out. I have a Facebook group that's a private community as well as an open community. Um, of course, I have my blog and my newsletters that I send out to, to communicate with people. So just that little bit of hope can keep someone going to the next step that they need to take. Yeah, that's awesome. What kind of reactions are you getting from people that realize that they're not alone? Sadly, I'm getting a lot of reactions of um, despair, you mm. know, and um, a lot of reactions of people who have who have gone through at least one of the same things that I've gone through. Um, and to me, that's very, very sad mm -hmm. that so many women have gone through it. So a few years ago, when the Me Too movement was at its height, um, I cannot express how deeply saddened I was by going through my Facebook feed and seeing all these women that I had gone to school with in elementary and high school and I had experienced um, parenthood with and done, my kids played sports with them and their kids and things like that. And even some of my children's friends uh, who are now adults saying, you know, hashtag me too on their feed just to say, mm -hmm. yeah, I've experienced something like this personally, or I know someone who has. And I, it just, 
it's way too prevalent in our society yeah. that women are preyed upon in those ways. Way too prevalent. It needs to needs to back down. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, down. it's we, you know, through podcasting and hearing some of these stories, I mean, it's just mind boggling. Yeah. Right. As to what some people experience, it's just, you know, <laughs> Uh, and, and I chuckle at it just because it's just so, um, I don't know, abnormally normal, if that's yes. the way to describe it. It's that just, is a great way to describe yeah. it because we accept it readily. We're just like, yeah. ah, that's yeah. the way it is. That's the way the world works. And it's like, right. but does it have to? No. Well, and, I, yeah, I'm sorry. You go. No, no, no. And, and through education, through knowledge, through connection and communications, we can stop it from being our normal. But it has to, you know, everybody has a part in that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I kind of go back to, you know, I have friends who are extremely concerned about the situation in Ukraine right now, right? Or they're extremely concerned about what's going on in Shanghai or other places around the world. And that's great. I think we all have a place for having our concern at different levels of locality. Um, for me personally, I just wanna help the next door neighbor. I wanna mm -hmm. help that person become uh, stronger in their own self. And then to me, that just ripples out like a, a stone in a pond, you know, it just, if I affect that one pond, then it's going to go all the way through. And to me, that's all it's about is just yeah. that one person. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's so great. I mean, it's what the world needs, right? It's just, we can't. Carry your corner. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So I was thinking like this, I was talking to a woman recently and you know, a few things have come up in these podcasts, and one was a woman in sales. And I, you know, as a guy, I just don't deal with the things that she dealt with, right? And she says, I get solicited, right? You know, advance people are making advances regularly, right? That's never happened to me. So I mean, it, you know, I, I, but it's just it's just like people go to work daily in sales, and this is the stuff they have to deal with, right? And then I spoke to another woman who said um, the other day I was having this great conversation, and she says, "Yeah, people, you know, guys, you know, they, you know, after hours, they want, you know, they want to walk me to the room or whatever," yeah. and she just says, "That's inappropriate." You know, she just she just has her de defense mechanism up there, like you know she where. Has she, to. Yeah, exactly, and it's just you know these are things that uh, you know are going on daily, right? Yeah. And most of us who are not dealing with it, um, you know, just don't know what's going on. So, how can we be supportive? How can people who are not seeing this on a regular basis? Is it just being more understanding, being more empathetic, or what is it we can do? Being more aware of yourself, quite honestly. Um, I've had a couple instances where I've been what the word now is triggered, um, mm -hmm. which means that then something has happened, whether it's words, actions, what have you, that then put me into a high state of anxiety as though I were back in one of these situations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Just for people to understand what that word really means. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Because some people don't. Um, yeah. And I have had that feeling um, of, of that trigger moment and it's intensely personal. Um, and a lot of people don't understand what that means unless they've had anxiety uh, about situations themselves. And because the way our world works, where women are perceived the way they are and men are perceived the way they are, for the majority, men don't have this same issue the same way that women do. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that's everyone. I, right. I realize there's exceptions to every rule. Rules sure. are made to be broken, all that good stuff. This is just my experience, right? So... Um, we were having a, a, a meeting, a group meeting, and a gentleman came up behind me, a man that I respect, that I um, have done work with and all of that. 
He meant absolutely no harm whatsoever, but he stood directly behind me, grabbed my shoulders, leaned in and spoke directly in my ear. Yeah. Just talking about it right now, I oh. can actually, I'm, I just kind of coughed a little bit there because mm -hmm. I can feel my heart rate racing right now. Mm -hmm. um, because that is a huge trigger for me. Mm -hmm. um, and he had no idea. Right. And so I think as men, what you can do is be more aware of how you react to and interact with the women who are in your business. Because would you do that to another man? Would he have walked up to another man like that and whispered in their ear like that? And it wasn't right. that he was whispering something inappropriate. It was completely appropriate. It just, the, the way he delivered it was completely inappropriate. Mm -hmm. Would you do that to him? Would you, Harry, walk up to a man that way? I'm Have trying to think of a situation where I would do that. So I'm struggling. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm struggling. And you're in a bar with, yeah. a, you know, you're doing some networking and you're in a bar, you're on a yeah. business trip. You know, these things happen all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. And like you said, more and more women are on these trips. So after that interaction in the bar, if you were there with your buddy, would you say to your buddy, hey, let me walk you to your room? Yeah, of course not. Probably not. <laughs> right. Because that would be weird. Wouldn't that it? would be weird. Yes. Yeah. Now, if you both are on the same floor anyway, that's a different yeah. situation, but mm -hmm. you wouldn't say, let me walk you to your room. Yeah. And you wouldn't right. say it in a kind of weird way either. No, no. Because that's exactly. the other thing. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so th I think this, we just yeah. need to, you know, as men and as women, we need to be more aware of how we interact with one another and kind of ask ourselves, would we, if a woman said those words to me, would I react the same way? And if a man said those words to me, would he say that to another man? And we just need to, to look at that. And, you know, respect is just not, it's just not as um, prevalent in our world. Everyone mm -hmm. demands respect for themselves. But I remember in school being taught, you get what you give for respect. And so if I don't respect the people around me, they're certainly not going to respect me. Mm -hmm. And respect has got to go out before it comes back. And a lot of people just don't don't get that at all. Right. Right. So. Yeah, exactly. All right. So thank you for sharing that. I mean, that's really, you know, it, it, uh, on the guy's part, you know, being more aware, understanding that, you know, there's people go through stuff and it's pretty common. Right. Even though everyone thinks they're unique, like you mentioned, it's just like the more you have these conversations, it's not uncommon. People can typically they can point to something. Right. This whole I mean, again, uh, you know, whether it's a movement, whether it's historical, where the people just never said anything, that there was shame involved and you name it uh, or that's just the way it was. You know, there's all kinds of stuff going on. But, you know, especially, you know, in business, you've got to be totally respectful for where people are coming from and, you know, just treat them like, you know, the golden rule, right? I mean, but it's, I've heard this line about treating people the way they want to be treated. Mm -hmm. So an example is, I mean, I hear people say this all the time. And, you know, one politician recently said, well, that's just the way I was raised. I'm an I'm a Italian, you know, we're very affectionate. And, you know, I, you know, I'm a, I apologize if you are offended by, you know, my actions. Yeah, you know, this, this line of I apologize if you are offended, not I apologize for being stupid. Right. right. Um, so that's that's the world. But. Even people who come from these backgrounds, you've got to have awareness that, yeah, maybe you are all touchy-feely. Doesn't mean the rest of the world is touchy-feely, right? I mean, it's just, I didn't grow up in one of those in one of those families that were all hugging and kissing, whatever. It's just not, we we're very reserved. Others, yeah, I get it. That doesn't mean you could go up to someone in my family and they're going to be comfortable with that, let alone if they had some kind of traumatic experience in life, right? Right. 
What's your thought on that? Oh, I think that's absolutely accurate. Um, my, uh, my family was rather reserved. I grew up in a Catholic family and I knew I was loved. There was no doubt about that, but we didn't do a lot of touching and hugging and kissing. Um, I don't even know that I could count on one hand, the number of times I hugged my dad as a child. Right. Um, now I hug him every time I see him now, you mm -hmm. know, I hug him when I see him, I hug him when we leave, you know, and, yeah. and mostly that's because he's figured out to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, which is awesome. I mean, he's nearly 80 years old and, and he's continuing to understand better ways to live his life, which, yeah. I mean, if that's not a great example for you, I don't know what is right. It is. And my yeah. mom, the same way, you know, she just, they didn't grow up in households that were touchy feely. They knew they were loved. There was mm -hmm. no doubt they were loved, but they, they weren't like that. And then, but my first husband was very much a hugger, mm -hmm. hugged, hugged, hugged. His mother is a hugger. And so that's, you know, where that comes from. And I, I mean, as a red flag, as a teenager, when I was dating him, I thought, oh, okay, we're going to hug all the time, you know, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> um, and, but I will tell you this, after I divorced him and I started to learn about who I was, because I never really did that because I was married so young. Um, but at the lovely age of 42, 43 years old, I started to figure out who I was and, and um, what I wanted out of life, where my boundaries were. And I find myself hugging people way more than I ever did. But if it's not someone that I know about, like the other day, I went and had a business meeting with someone and this lady, we had such a connection, right? I was supposed to be like a 10 minute introduction and I'm out of her hair and I was there for an hour and we just enjoyed, it was like 10 minutes went by. We had the greatest connection and conversation. Mm -hmm. And at the end I asked her, can I hug you? Cause I feel like we're friends now. And she said, absolutely. And yeah. so we hugged, you know, and it was like, and I don't do that with everyone, but, um, and some people you can read that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it does make me a little uncomfortable, just not necessarily for my own sake, but for others, when someone else will come in to hug me without asking permission. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, maybe it's the first time I met them. They're like, oh, I'm just a hugger. And they just hug you. And it's like, okay, well, that's great. You're a hugger. Um, <laughs> I didn't yeah, think that's... we were there yet, but okay. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, that's yeah. yeah. I just, you know, it's just another level of respect. It's another level of reading the room. Yeah. Right. We've all heard that phrase. Read exactly. The room. Um, and so if the room's not getting it, then you shouldn't be doing it is basically a great way to respond to that. I love it. Yeah. I was funny because I was uh, spent a couple of years in the Dominican Republic. And if you weren't a hugger going in, you're definitely a hugger coming out. I mean, it's just everybody. I mean, you greeted people with a kiss. I mean, it was like, oh, my goodness, this is so awkward for me. Um, yeah. And, right? and but not it, but that was a society. Yeah. yeah. A lot of societies, not American, do that yeah. regularly. Yeah. Yeah, but, exactly. So, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's. You know, I, I don't have the, all the answers. I think in America, we're generally a little bit more uptight and reserved. But then go to go to some other countries that are even more reserved. Right. And then you yeah. say, wow, we're pretty open. Right. So right. it's you know, it's it's a, it's an interesting world. I love the whole differences in humanity. But I think the, the key thing here is in this conversation, like you said, it's not just reading it's like reading the room and if the room is one other person you've got to read the person oh, right yeah. if the person is standing there with their arms closed together you know you know that that's not a welcoming yeah give me a hug and i met a, a couple of women from linkedin i've never met before recently and they both you know first thing they did is they reached out their arms like we're hugging so you know it's just that's you know it's okay i'm cool with it but I don't want to lead with it, especially if it's, right, I'll hug guys now, right? The, the Dominican Republic helped me hug men like it was normal, right? I mean, again, not, it was just, it was different in growing up 
in New England in a conservative family that was really not outgoing. Then it's like, I'm hugging guys. It's okay. It's all good. And I just learned to have fun with it, right? Yeah, that's that's a 180 there. <laughs> yeah, it's a 180. And, if, and since then, I mean, my whole demeanor, again, if you can imagine, you know, like you, like Midwest principles, I mean, I had older parents. It just wasn't anything that was done in the house. And I could totally relate. I started hugging my father years later, right? Um, thankfully. But, yes. you know, I, I try to do that with my kids, but it's just still tough when you have <laughs> this background, yeah. right? Because I, I keep saying to myself, my dad never hugged me. So it's like, oh. Do I do this? Right? Yes. Oh. So I put my hand on the shoulder and I'm just trying to, but, you know, this Does when they're younger is hug? really easy. <laughs> Right, I could pick them up, hug them all the time when they're younger. It's when they became adults that it's kind of awkward. All right, you know, so enough the about sad me. Thing, the sad thing about that, though, <laughs> you're so funny, um, is that as our children become adults, is when they need it even. Yeah. More. Yeah. Okay. You know, there's, yep. there's. I talk about some of the time in my uh, relationships where my children were becoming teenagers, and I found myself mostly unemployed and so at home a lot more and they were all um middle school and up and i really i tell this to every parent that will listen so you're going to hear this on okay the podcast, whether you want to or not i want it's to relevant or not um your children need you more when they're teenagers than they do when they're two years old when they're a year old when they're you know toddlers pre-k and the reason i say that is because as toddlers, pre-K, infants, anybody can put a bottle in their mouth. Anybody can teach them please and thank you. Anybody can teach them potty training, right? And we know this because we see mm -hmm. this all the time, yep. right? And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that can be done that way. Mm -hmm. If you can build your life in a way that then when they are 12, 13, 14 and up, and they're going into that young adulthood, the decisions they're making at that time of life can impact the rest of their lives in ways that you cannot even imagine. And I know this because of my decisions that I mm -hmm. made as a 15, 16, 17 year old and what I did. And then also being there for my kids at that time. And when you read the book, you realize that, you know, financially, and relationship wise with their father, everything was crumbling around us. Um, yet I was able to be there for my kids in a way that I wouldn't have been able to any other time because of the fact that I was largely unemployed at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but to be there when they need you for these bigger life decisions of, you know, do I hang out with this person or not and why? Um, and how do I get out of situations that I find myself in? Um, I can remember telling, sitting my kids down before they would go out and I would say, okay, so no. And they'd be like, what, what? And I said, Ma I'm mom. I said, no, now you can tell your friends that for anything you want to say <laughs> all weekend long, my mom said no, and you won't be lying right? because I said no. Yeah. And they, they would do like you, they would laugh, you know, and, but I do think that that made it easier for them to be able to get themselves out of situations that they would have been in. I love it. Yeah. It's so great. Yeah. It's a Just theory. Throw, well, no, I mean, I use it. I use it in Isn't uh, parenting a theory. Anyway? Right. Yeah. Yes. I mean, so funny. Uh, so <clears throat> as a parent, I've learned the value of no. And there's a guy who I work with in sales who struggled with the no word. And he kept finding himself doing things he regretted because yeah. he couldn't say no to people. Mm. So I said, look, the f you can always change no to yes. It's super difficult to change yes to no. Yeah. So as a parent, I learned that saying no immediately was okay because I could change the no to yes. But man, if I said yes immediately, I was living with it, <laughs> right? So he, 
<laughs> so he, he was giving rides to people to events and it's just it was just silly i'm like dude just say no first <laughs> and then come around and say you know i was thinking how we might be able to help but you know saying yes immediately and then you know you're finding that you're bringing a woman to an event that your wife's not happy about you know it's just you know and he was just a nice guy right but he just you know struggled with the no word so you you i don't want to use the word triggered but the thought came back to me right but anyway uh so what i want to ask you jen is jen can i go jen or jennifer does it, jen, okay yeah. all right jen is the how does this help people in business with what you're doing and uncovering these things or helping people how does it translate to business that's a great question. And I appreciate you asking me that because, you know, I am a personal mentor. I'm not a business mentor. And a lot of people are like, well, what's the difference, you mm. know, and, and so many coaches out there right now and mentors are specifically for your business. Right. But in my experience, you got to get your personal stuff together before you can really be successful in the business world. And while, yes, you could be successful without getting your personal stuff together, it's not going to last. It's not mm -hmm. sustainable. And so, you know, for those of you who are like, well, I'm successful. I got all of it together in the business world. I'm making millions of dollars or whatever your goals are. Mm -hmm. You know, you're beating them all. But inside you come home at night and you're just, you know, a wreck and you're treating your family terribly. And life other than in the, you you maybe even have become a workaholic because you don't want to deal with the other stuff right right so really what kind of life is that is that really hitting the lifestyle you want and so business and and i'm sure you talk about this just with the whole selling with dignity um premise is that you're being true to yourself but also serving your clients right and so if you have personal stuff you haven't dealt with and therefore you're not dealing you're you're focusing on one area of life and ignoring another then you're going to end up in um it's going to fall apart you know mm -hmm. that that is a house built on shifting sands for sure mm -hmm. and so we end up in um when we find ourselves working on ourselves as uncomfortable as it can be at first, but then as you go through the process, you realize how amazingly awesome it is. Um, and you start seeing some change in life and you take the next right action item step, then things start to get exciting because now you've got the success in business, potentially you've already got it, but now you can shore up that foundation and your family is right there with you, your mm -hmm. loved ones, whoever that is, you know, and, and family is a word that means something different to every single one of us, because we all families come in all different shapes and sizes, <laughs> right? And for some people, it's their dogs, for some people, it's other people, you know, um, and so whatever that looks like for you, as part of your business goals, and I think most managers get this these days, they also look at what is your lifestyle goal you know how do you mm -hmm. want to live your life and how do we do this thing that's a misnomer called work-life balance right because there's really no balance but you know you're either working or you're not and life is all the time so there's not really a it's a misnomer i don't like that term but uh, a lot of people understand what i mean when i say that so that's where we're gonna go with yep um but that's what I look at is, is, you know, if you can get your personal stuff together, you've got a much stronger foundation to build things on. I will tell you that both my first husband, as well as myself, have been more successful in our careers since our divorce, hmm. which is a well, little because there's growth, sorry. right? Because there's growth, coincidentally, yes. would be my response to that. Not because yes. of the divorce, but the growth. No, it wasn't because right? of the divorce. It was because we married very young. We were yeah. 19. We already had two children at that point. And um, there is a psychological thought that, a, a thought in psychology that 
Um, when someone goes through a traumatic event as a child, they stop their emotional growth, mm. that it can stall out right there. Mm -hmm. And I would say that in a, and, and he went through stuff as a nine and a 10 year old. I went through stuff as an eight and a nine year old. But then we got together and we got married at 19 after having children at 17 and 18. Um, and so I would say even that a large part of our problems were that we were both kind of stunted at that 19 year old, yeah. right? And when you're 40 and you're acting like a 19 year old emotionally, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Right. Yeah. And so we ended up and um, we got divorced shortly after we got divorced, like within a year, he got some incredible promotion that he had been trying to get for the last three or four years. And I had encouraged him to get it because I felt like that's what he deserved. Mm -hmm. um, but it just never came through until after all of that went down, which a lot of people, when they go through a divorce, it's actually the opposite, at least to, uh, <clears throat> at first, you know, those first couple of years, they kind of implode their world, mm -hmm. um, which I did a little bit of that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you can get yourself together personally, which is what I then did eventually. And once I figured that out, now I've had opportunities I never would have had, except for I've had this personal growth and personal development into myself into my true self right. um which is the person you see sitting in front of you today yeah so. that's awesome yeah, yeah it's such a great story so then you once you do that did you immediately say i can help others or was there something else that drew you to that idea so it's funny you ask that so as i'm going through these career changes right and um some of the things are happening i realized about five years in that everything that i liked doing in my career had to do with helping others figure it out and figure out the industry mm -hmm. right and so that's when i went hmm there might be something here right <laughs> so, <laughs> so i'm thinking to myself one day i'm like you know i love that i get to help people like that and and because i was trying to figure out what to do with my career and so then um I also was sitting there in January of 2019 at my kitchen table, looking at my husband, my new husband, who I've had now for almost five years. He's amazing. Um, and I looked across the table at him and I said, I don't want to be sitting here in a year and not have written my book. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, then do it. So <laughs> we figured it out and made a plan and I hired an author mentor to help me out and, and all of that and um, got the book published initially three years ago. Um, the, the version out now is actually expanded from that initial version and I've increased it by about 10,000 words and it's a completely different approach to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So this is definitely a, a help to people mm -hmm. because there's action steps that you can take. You can see what did Jen do to work through this and try those things and if they work for you awesome if they don't read the next chapter there'll be other stuff right <laughs> yeah exactly it doesn't have to be everything that works but you'll find things no, right you'll find yeah. what works for you absolutely yeah. yeah and then you know the whole thing is is that you're when you have these conversations with people it's just the light bulbs go on people start realizing that they're not alone that what you've done they can do i mean there's all kinds of things that even though the person may be all set right because they don't want to deal with the challenge and has this ever come up where they just like yeah i'm good but then you find out that they're really not good and then yeah oh yeah i mean i talk to people like that all day every day yeah okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> but they're not people who hire me to be a mentor for them yeah. because they yeah. think they got it all together and that's yeah. fine yeah, that's but then the right. time, well, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, and that's perfectly fine. When they're ready, yeah. they'll be ready. Exactly. And maybe the time... I'll be the person, maybe I won't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And all you're doing is making yourself available. Yep. Right, which is really ties in nicely to sales, is that you just make yourself available 
when people are ready, they'll buy. When people are ready to get some kind of coaching and to deal with the stuff that they just don't want to deal with, then you know we're there to help, right? So it's a yep. great attitude. Exactly. So, Jen, where can people find more of you? Because <laughs> love your personality, love your attitude. You've gone through it. You've come out of it, and you know uh, that life can be better for people, and you're there to help. So where can people find more of you? Well, I have a website, which is my name, jenniferandersonsmith.com. Uh, as a note, it's Jennifer Anderson with an E-N. We are Danish. <laughs> ah, um, but and I also am on Facebook and LinkedIn and um, Instagram. So you can find me there under growth community as well as under my name. Um, growth community is the group that I do all of my mentoring work under. Uh, and so we even have a private Facebook group called growth community that you can find. If you find me on Facebook, Jennifer Anderson Smith, um, you find my bio page there, uh, my author page, you can link from that into my growth community or just go to my website and it's even easier. So, and the book is available through Amazon as well as major retailers. Uh, right now, we are in a pre-order status for our um, the ebook version, which will be the first one to come out. It'll um, come out May seventeenth. So, I'm not sure when this is going to air in relation afterwards, because we're close okay. to May seventeenth. But maybe we can have the link in the show notes if you want yeah, to send me great. the link. I'll put it in the notes. That would be great. So awesome. Um, so the ebook will be out by the time you see this, and then the hardcover will be available May 24th. Um, and so then uh, anyone who wants an autographed copy can let me know that just by shooting me an email or reaching out to contact me on my website. I'd be happy to do that for you. Awesome. Yeah. Sounds great. Thank you. All right. Exciting times. Thanks, <laughs> Jennifer Anderson with an E, Smith, for the great conversation today. Thanks, we'll talk Harry. to you soon, dear. All right. Man, sales is tough. I'm just not cut out to be a salesperson. Have you ever felt that way? Selling doesn't need to be so difficult. My name is Harry Spate. I'm here to serve and to help you succeed. Join me as we discuss sales made easy.